Let's say you live here and you work here at the Chicago Executive Airport. You get ready for work and head out the door to the parking garage where you meet your old Nissan Quest. You turn the key and, oh no, the car won't start. Great, that's the third time this month this thing has broken down. What a fantastic start to the day. How are you gonna get to work now? Well, you remember there's a metro that goes by the airport, so you look it up. Maybe today isn't gonna be so bad after all. Besides, not driving for a day might be more relaxing and, oh wait, there's no station to the airport. Well, it's only three miles from the nearest station. Someone could pick you up or at worst you'll have to walk. Okay, this could work. You head down to Union Station, look at the board, and damn, you just missed the next train. Well, that's fine. You'll just wait for the next one. You do have some time after all. You look up at the board and see the next departure, and it's blank. This must be wrong. You run up to an employee and ask for the next train, but they only say there's just one outbound train in the morning. You curl up in a ball and cry on the station floor. What a great first impression, right? Unfortunately, this experience is standard for most American commuter rail. Most trains only run frequently into the city in the morning and then outbound in the evening. This scheduling pattern haunts almost every single transit agency in North America. Even some of the busiest services in the country aren't free from the scheduling. In fact, the busiest commuter rail line, the Long Island Railroad's Babylon branch, follows this exact pattern, with trains only coming in every hour from each of its terminals during non-peak hours. One train an hour is the best you'll get on most commuter lines, and that's not even mentioning weekdays or holidays where services get so bad that you might as well not even take the train. This scheduling pattern only benefits workers who live in the suburbs and work in the city, with everyone else seemingly being an afterthought. So it's no surprise that when COVID and working from home took off, these transit agencies suffered immensely. And even now, after COVID has been dealt with, commuter lines around the country can't seem to regain their pre-pandemic numbers. Agencies like the Long Island Railroad are still millions of passengers behind what they were achieving pre-COVID. There's a good reason why these transit agencies aren't recovering like they normally should. One of the main reasons is the rise of popularity of remote work. Instead of commuting to the office every day, many companies are now giving employees the option to work some of their work days at home. This directly targets the main demographic that commuter rail is trying to capture. Schedules for commuter rail are built around bringing people to work in the city and traveling back home to the suburbs. With fewer people working in offices, however, there isn't as big a demand for commuter-style transit, and agencies haven't changed their schedule to reflect this change. They still run the same morning and evening trains without the large commuter base that supported the system. And unlike what a lot of people think, I don't believe that city office space will ever fully recover from COVID. The benefits of working from home are just too enticing for workers, and they'll demand to work at least some days at home. And while we don't see it now, many companies will slowly give in to these demands. The obvious solution is for agencies to adjust their schedules to meet the demand of every passenger, no matter the time of day. Running trains not only every hour, but every 20 to 30 minutes will help significantly in the next major problem these agencies face. Frequency, frequency, frequency. I have and will continue to say this while talking about transit. The frequency of transit is an enormous factor in obtaining and retaining passengers. If a train comes every hour, people will be less likely to ride it. If you missed a train, no one's going to wait an hour till the next one. If it was 20 minutes, however, people are likely to stay to catch the next train. It's simply about convenience. They need to learn to implement this type of thinking into their schedules to regain the ridership that they desperately need. While frequency is a significant part of ridership, modern infrastructure is also needed to support the frequent trains, including improved stations and modern equipment. Buying modern equipment and fixing crumbling track infrastructure will prevent delays due to equipment failure and speed up services by allowing faster travel and preventing the infamous slow zones that haunt certain transit networks. Many systems across the United States are using infrastructure and rolling stock that's decades past their prime, which leads these transit agencies to use most of their available funding to upkeep equipment and fix broken infrastructure, rather than investing those funds into modern equipment and expanding services. More funding to modernize commuter rail will, in turn, lower operating costs for these railroads. Let's take a look at an example of a commuter rail service that has a lot of potential to become a great regional rail with certain improvements. With the service's first role as a background character in the Emmy award-winning show Better Call Saul, the Railrunner Express has been servicing the metro areas of Albuquerque and Santa Fe in the state of New Mexico. The system runs along BNSF-owned track, which the Railrunner has priority over after the state of New Mexico bought the right-of-way from BNSF. The system has a total of 15 stations, with 10 being in the Albuquerque metro area, 2 in native reservations, and the remaining 3 being in Santa Fe's metro. The system started operation in 2006, servicing Albuquerque and its suburbs. The system was then expanded in 2008, extending to Santa Fe. Speaking of Santa Fe, let's look at the reason this line was set up in the first place. 
The city relies on commuters, with over 50% of the city's workforce living outside of the city. Most of these commuters come from, you guessed it, Albuquerque. With the only logical connection between these cities being I-25, the rapid expansion of these two cities left the interstate congested as thousands of people commuted between them. Legislators wanted to ease congestion on I-25 due to the vast amount of commuters traveling between the cities, so plans were put in place to build a commuter rail service connecting Albuquerque and Santa Fe. You can see this line of thinking in the railroaders schedule, with many of the trains running from Albuquerque to Santa Fe in the morning and then vice versa in the evening. While building a rail line for commuters may have been a good option in 2006, over time the railroaders' ridership has been slowly falling, going from 1.2 million annual passengers in 2010 to only 750,000 in 2019. This was even before COVID struck, which as you may have guessed devastated the commuter rail. The system to this day hasn't fully recovered only having around 450,000 annual riders in 2022. The New Mexico Department of Transportation released in its annual ridership report the three main reasons it believes current ridership is lower than in 2019's. The reasons given are lower gas prices, infrequent rail service, and long travel times. So let's go over these issues that they list. Their first problem is lower gas prices. Lower prices mean more people are willing to drive the route rather than take the train. Many people currently ride the Railrunner Express since it's cheaper than spending money on gas. Since their business model is centered around transporting workers between Albuquerque and Santa Fe, lower gas prices mean quicker travel to get to work faster. This means more workers are willing to spend more money driving their car than taking the train if gas isn't overly expensive. Their second reason given is infrequent service. I'll say it again, frequency is the key to good service. If you have to wait an hour for the train, which for the rail runner you most likely have to, there will be fewer people willing to wait that long only for the cheaper price. Taking a car is already quicker than taking the train, so adding up to an additional hour to an already lengthier trip will turn many potential customers to look elsewhere, which ties into the agency's last problem, long travel times. Most rail lines in the United States are limited to 79 miles an hour because of this. Now, 79 miles an hour isn't horrible. What is bad, however, is how long the journey takes. By car, the journey is around an hour, when it takes the rail runner more than an hour and a half. So the single thing the rail runner is trying to compete against is over 30% faster. No wonder Saul decided to drive. So yeah, the system faces some serious problems. So let's see how we can fix them. Let's look at the most pressing issue first, infrequent service. To solve this, the Railrunner Express needs to run additional trains, preferably one every 30 minutes in each direction. They need to run these trains every day from at least 4 in the morning to 11 at night, including weekends and holidays. In the future, they can even cut travel times down further to running trains every 20 minutes or even less. With trains on a predictable and set schedule, passengers don't need to worry about what day or what time it is. As long as the system is open, they will be guaranteed a train every half an hour. More people would use this system if this plan is implemented. The second issue presented in the report is long travel times, and unfortunately I don't think there's any big solution within reason to solve this problem. Yes, you could somewhat improve efficiency at stations, but doing just that won't cut travel times down by very much. The only way to increase speed significantly is faster track speed, which is a lot more difficult than it may initially seem. Living in Illinois, I understand the political, financial, and bureaucratic struggle to upgrade track speed past 79 miles an hour. Our own plan to upgrade track speed to 110 on the Lincoln service took way too long and costed way too much. I mean, even after 13 years, track speed is still only at 90. Upgrading the railrunner's track speed would be very costly and have a lot of opposition from within the government, unless they can either upgrade the track at a much lower cost or hope that some large government change cuts the bureaucracy involving in upgrading track speed. I don't think it's reasonable to think that a smaller agency like the railrunner can afford to upgrade its track speeds. However, I don't think that travel time is that big of an issue, at least compared to all the others. It only takes half an hour longer than by car. If the frequency of the service is improved, I'm sure more people wouldn't mind taking a little longer to travel if it means a more comfortable and relaxing experience. Their last problem mentioned is low gas prices. Again, there isn't really anything the agency can do here. There will always be some riders that will only take the train to save money on gas. When gas is cheaper, they will almost always take their car. What the agency can do is appeal to a larger base of people, advertise the comfort of taking the train, that you can get work done while traveling, and that you don't have to stress while driving every single day. Advertising the benefits of taking the train, whether through advertisement or through word of mouth, will drive more people to use the system, which will improve the problems of low ridership.
The rail runner isn't unique in facing these issues. Most transit agencies in America face the same problems as the rail runner. From Caltrain to Metra to SEPTA and Metro North, all these agencies face infrequent service issues and comparatively low ridership numbers compared to before the pandemic struck. Luckily though, the same problems also have the same solutions. If commuter rail around America were to implement the changes that I said before, we could easily compete with regional rail in the rest of the developed world. Giving people better regional rail service will improve the areas surrounding the routes and get cars off the roads and highways. Agencies and governments can improve our regional rail. We just need to speak out, demand more trains on the schedules, campaign for modern rolling stock, and improved infrastructure. Then maybe they will listen and give the funding and support to make these changes happen. Let's make regional rail work for everyone, not just commuters who travel in and out of the city. Then we can have some truly great systems running throughout America. And for the love of God, fix whatever this thing is. Mm -hmm.